and we've now reached our start time, 2.30 Eastern. Libby, the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for joining our presentation today entitled Opioid Overdose Prevention and Naloxone Training. We're glad you're here with us today, and please know Alliant is here to help and support you now and always. I am Libby. Bickers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have been a social worker for over 20 years in various areas. Specifically, I've worked with hospice for about 10 years, also as an oncology social worker, in dialysis, home health, long-term care, and inpatient hospital settings. I've also worked with graduate MSW students in the area of field instruction at my alma mater, Valdosta State University. I've been a clinical reviewer for over five years with Alliant Health Solutions, and now I'm happy to be working with the Alliant Quality Team as the Behavioral Health Lead, and I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Isaac is a pharmacist for the Injury and Violence Prevention Branch at the North Carolina Division of Public Health. She helps to support the expansion of various clinical programs and policies around increasing access to medication-assisted treatment, integration of harm reduction strategies into health systems, and education around safer prescribing practices. Her work also includes coordination of naloxone distribution across North Carolina for a variety of community level and state partners as a practicing community pharmacist, she's been actively engaged for several years in leading key pharmacist initiatives on addressing the opioid crisis, including safer syringe sales, naloxone training, and implementation of medication take-back programs. She received her Doctor of Pharmacy and Master of Public Health degrees from the University of South Carolina and completed a postgraduate pharmacy residency at the University of Georgia. We're very happy to have her here with us today to help us learn more. Dr. Amanda Isaac, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much Libby um, for that introduction and for inviting me to be here with you all today. It's great to see so many familiar um, faces and names. So we will jump right in. Objectives for today, we're going to look at some of the trends um, around opioid overdose rates in North Carolina, describe the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, and learn how to respond to an overdose, including how to administer naloxone. So I wanted to start out with some data, and I am not an epidemiologist by any means, but I think the data is really important to help paint a better picture of the magnitude of this crisis, both on a state and national level. So in North Carolina, and I hate to start out with such a doom and gloom slide, but we have about six people um, in North Carolina that, that die every single day of an unintentional medication or drug overdose. And for a long time, car accident deaths were the leading cause of unintentional death in North Carolina. But around 2011, 2012, we really saw a change in that trajectory. And now um, overdoses are the leading cause of unintentional death in our state by far. So when the opioid crisis began, the primary driver was prescription opioids. So things like oxycodone, hydrocodone, but over the past few years, you can see that also has really changed. And now the majority of our overdoses that are occurring in our state and across the country, really, um, we're seeing involve heroin and some type of synthetic opioid like fentanyl, which many of you may have heard about. So while limiting the supply of prescription opioids is still a really important part of our state's opioid action plan, a lot of our efforts have really shifted more downstream towards preventing overdoses due to fentanyl and other illicit opioids. We also know that majority of our overdoses um, include multiple substances, so things like alcohol, other illicit substances, medications like benzodiazepines. Um, so some examples of benzodiazepines are Xanax, Valium. We're finding that opioid overdoses um, co-occur with other substances very frequently. As far as the number of overdoses in North Carolina, we actually were excited to see a slight tipping off in 2018. And then unfortunately in 2019, that number rose back up. Um, because death data takes a little bit longer to finalize, we don't have 2020 death data quite yet. 
However, we know that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on overdose rates in our state and across the country, and um, sadly expect that number to have increased in 2020. So speaking of COVID, um, often you'll hear people say that the opposite of addiction is connection. And if you think about the past um, year in 2020 in general, we haven't been connected to people at all, right? People lived in isolation. Some people lost their jobs. They may have been in unsafe environments. There was grief, depression, anxiety, and all of that really just created a perfect storm for people that use drugs or people with a substance use disorder. We know from the CDC data that over 81,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States from May 2019 to May 2020. And that's the highest number of overdose deaths ever recorded in a 12 month period. Um, synthetic opioids like fentanyl, which we talked about, appear to be the primary driver of these increases in opioid overdoses. And we also saw that overdose deaths, including or involving psychostimulants, so things like methamphetamine, increased by 34%. So we're watching that at the state level. And part of the reason that we recently expanded our state um, opioid action plan to be more inclusive of other substances like methamphetamine. Specifically in North Carolina, you can see last year in 2020, we had a 24% increase in the number of ED visits specifically due to opioid overdose. So across the board, due to any cause, ED visits were down last year, right? People were staying home. They were afraid to go to the emergency department because they didn't want to contract COVID. So the fact that we saw such a large increase in ED visits specifically due to opioid overdoses is pretty significant and telling to um, the, the impact that COVID has had on the crisis. So what's the state doing about this? In 2017, Governor Cooper announced the um, Opioid Action Plan. This was updated in the summer of 2019 and then again just a couple weeks ago actually to be renamed the Opioid and Substance Use Action Plan. It's a three-pronged approach focused on prevention, reducing harm, and getting people to care for treatment. Um, under reducing harm, you can see one of the key strategies is increasing availability to naloxone, which will be the focus of today's presentation. So naloxone is an opioid antagonist, and what that means is that it blocks the receptor that opioids typically attach to. So if someone overdoses on an opioid, whether intentionally or unintentionally, opioids overwhelm receptors all over the body, and that can put someone into a situation where they can't breathe or are having trouble breathing. So in those emergency situations, that's when naloxone is given. And what naloxone does is it comes in and it kicks the, the opioid off the receptor to help restore breathing in that person. It starts working really quickly, typically within two to five minutes, and stays in the system for 20 to 90 minutes. Um, it's the, one of the safest, if not the safest medication I'm aware of. If you give it to someone that doesn't have opioids in their system, nothing is going to happen. However, depending on what the person ingested and how potent it is, they might experience some temporary withdrawal symptoms after you give them naloxone. So things like sweating, vomiting, irritability, those are all normal and temporary. Um, naloxone, you can't become addicted to it by any means. It's also safe to be given um, in all ages and in pregnancy with caution not to cause distress to the baby. In 2018, the former U.S. General um, Jerome Adams released a public health advisory or urging more people to carry naloxone and know how to use it. I was actually at a conference in Sacramento a couple of years ago where he was the keynote speaker, and he asked everyone to raise their hands if they knew how to perform CPR. And pretty much every, all 200 people in the room raised their hands. And then he asked to raise your hand if you are carrying naloxone, and I think maybe one or two people raised their hand um, and the response was, you're much more likely to encounter someone outside the four walls of this hotel that's experienced overdose than you are a arrest. So not to say that knowing CPR is not so really important, but carrying naloxone can really help save a life. So we want everyone to carry naloxone, but what's North Carolina doing to expand access? So in 2013, General Statute 90-12.7 was passed, and um, it's commonly called called the naloxone access law. What this did is it allowed healthcare providers to prescribe naloxone either directly 
via prescription or by standing order to anyone at risk of an overdose or anyone who might be in a situation to help someone at risk of an overdose. So that's commonly called third party prescribing because it's being prescribed to a person who may not be the ultimate user or recipient of the medication. This law also provided civil and criminal immunity for people prescribing and administering naloxone. In 2016, legislation was passed in North Carolina that authorized the state health director to sign a standing order, which allowed for pharmacists licensed by the North Carolina Board of Pharmacy to dispense naloxone to eligible people without them having to have a physical prescription from their doctor. And the intention of the standing order was to be as broad as possible so that anyone at risk of experiencing an overdose, their family, friends, or anyone in a situation to assist could walk into a pharmacy and request naloxone. So this could include a concerned family member, a librarian, a law enforcement agent, and beyond. So um, very broad coverage. Naloxone can be processed under insurance at the pharmacy if that person has coverage. We do find that most insurance plans um, cover at least one form of naloxone. And so um, you may have to play around with it a little bit. But also in North Carolina, we do not have any age restrictions on getting naloxone from a pharmacy. We have a website in North Carolina called naloxonesaves.org, and that houses tons of resources regarding naloxone access in our state. It has patient education materials, and we highly encourage you all to check it out. But on that website, you can view a map of all the pharmacies in the state that have indicated to NCDHHS that they are dispensing naloxone understanding order. So you can actually view by county and see what your closest pharmacy is um, to refer folks to. In 2017, access to naloxone was expanded even further in North Carolina when a provision was added to the law that allowed for organization that promote scientifically proven ways of mitigating health risks associated with substance use disorder to distribute naloxone. So this includes organizations like syringe service programs, faith-based facilities, health departments, and others to distribute naloxone out in the community under a distribution standing order. Many of you are familiar with um, North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition, for example. They are a syringe service program um, along with about 40 other SSPs in our state that distribute naloxone understanding order out in the community. We know that community distribution of naloxone is increasing and it's super effective. This is just a graphic from our syringe service program annual report. You can see last year syringe service programs across the state distributed over 53,000 kits of naloxone, which is pretty incredible considering a lot of this reporting period was during COVID when people were staying home and a lot of services were reduced across the board. So who should receive naloxone? And this is by no means a comprehensive list, but these are some of the highest risk factors to consider. So people taking high doses of opioids or those taking opioids for um, a long period of time for chronic pain, those that are taking medications to treat opioid use disorder or have a history of an overdose, people taking opioids in combinations with other higher risk medications like benzodiazepines, which we talked about a little bit earlier, people leaving environments like correctional facilities or detox centers. And the reason that's a risk factor is typically when folks are in those types of settings, they're not taking opioids. And so when they are released or um, discharged, they go back to taking the same amount that they were taking prior to be admitted, that could be too much on their body and put them into a situation where they overdose. Again, anyone who requests naloxone and believes that they could be in a situation to assist, whether they are a friend, family member, coworker, they can also receive naloxone. So there are a lot of risk factors not specifically listed here that could make someone a good candidate to receive naloxone. For example, someone that's taking opioid and has existing breathing problems, people taking opioids and having kids or grandkids in the house, um, elderly adults who may have forgotten that they took their pain medication and end up accidentally double dosing or triple dosing. Also, as we age, our bodies change um, and the way we metabolize medications change. So we may not be able to tolerate certain doses of opioids and that could result in a dangerous situation where having a little on hand could help. So let's talk about the three forms of naloxone. Um, currently, there are three on the market. There used to be a product called Evzio, 
Um, it looks like this. It's an auto injector and it would talk you through how to use um, how to use it. However, as of late last year, it's no longer being manufactured, but it it'll it's just an auto injector and it'll actually talk to you through how to respond to the overdose and how to give it. So you may see some of these still out in the field, but um, it's no longer being manufactured. Also last month, there was a new product um, called Cloxado approved. It's a new form of naloxone. It's just a higher dose of the current nasal spray that's on the market. It's an eight milligram versus a four milligram that's currently on the market. So we may hear more about that soon. So we're going to talk through each of these forms and how to use them, but this is just a summary of the three forms. You can see two are given in the nose and one is given in the muscle using a plain old needle and syringe. So we talked about um, how naloxone is available at a pharmacy, but that's not the only place you can get naloxone. So for people that are uninsured or have high copays, getting naloxone at a pharmacy might not be the most feasible option, right? So it's important that we're giving um, other access points. Um, out the health departments actually maybe a little bit more give out naloxone at no cost, along with several um, syringe service programs. So you can find a, a list of everyone that's indicated to us that they're giving out free or reduced cost naloxone at naloxonesaves.org. The picture there on the right is actually um, a billboard here in Raleigh, where I'm located. That was put up recently by the Wake County Health Department advertising um, naloxone availability at their health department. So lots of options for people that um, can't get it at a pharmacy for whatever reason. So before we go on to training on how to use naloxone, I just want to touch briefly on a couple of the myths that I hear frequently and you may hear from people or leaders in your community. The first is that naloxone is enabling or acts as a safety net for people to use drugs. And there have been so many studies on this and they've actually found that communities that have naloxone and um, education programs, they had reduced fatalities due to overdose and they also had decreased rates of overdose. The other thing I hear is that naloxone prevents someone from seeking treatment. Again, there's no no evidence of this, and I'd actually argue that it's death that prevents someone from seeking treatment. Um, really, an overdose could serve as a catalyst for someone to want to seek treatment. So I'm happy to share any of this data with anyone who's interested. Again, there's been lots of, of published literature on this. All right, so let's learn how to respond to an overdose. So if someone's overdose, they might not be responsive. They might not have have, um, so they might have slow or shallow breathing because the opioids, again, affect areas of the brain that control breathing. The person might be making gurgling noises. They might have blue lips or nails um, from the lack of oxygen. Their skin might be cold or clammy um, and their pupils might get tiny or constricted. This is also called pinpoint pupils. If you find anyone that's experienced any of these symptoms, the first step is to try to wake them up. Um, if they're unresponsive, call 911 first. If you have naloxone, administer it, and we're gonna talk through how to do that in just a second. But remember I said that um, even if you don't know what that person has overdosed on, you can still give naloxone. If they don't have opioids in their system, then naloxone might not work, but it's not going to harm them. So go ahead and give the naloxone if you think um, it might be an overdose and have it on hand. Perform rescue breathing if you know how or trained. And then lastly, put the person into recovery position, which is just on their side, just in case they vomit. You don't want them to accidentally choke. And then again, staying with that person until help arrives um, or EMS arrives. The first type of naloxone that we're gonna learn how to use is called Narcan nasal spray. Um, I actually had to go to my office yesterday for the first time in, in 17 months to grab these demos. Um, but this is Narcan nasal spray. It comes with two kits for a, or two devices per kit and very easy to use. So um, if you suspect overdose, you go ahead and insert one spray into one out. If the person doesn't want um, or doesn't get back after two to three minutes, what you'll do is use the other dose and insert it into the opposite nostril. And it's just clicking the plunger once and it should administer the spray. Very easy to use. Again, it'll come two devices per kit. 
The next type of naloxone you might see is just a traditional um, vials and syringes. Um, most of the syringes that you'll probably be dispensed are one milliliter per vial. Um, so again, every kit that you get should have two vials and two syringes. So if someone has overdosed, what you would do is take your syringe, go ahead and draw up, pop off the cap, draw up the one milliliter into the syringe, and then insert it into the muscle of their upper arm or their thigh. Again, wait two to three minutes. If the person is still unresponsive, what you'll do is take the other vial, draw it up in another syringe, and go ahead and um, inject it into the muscle again. Sometimes depending on what the person ingested, you might need two doses, you might need three or four, or, um, hopefully not too much more of that. One box that we'll talk about um, is a little bit less common, but you might still see it. And what it is, it's a pre-filled syringe that you attach to this device called a um, mucosal atomizing device to, I'm gonna abbreviate for NAD. And um, what it does is it allows the liquid in here to be sprayed into the nostril as the as a spray than it having to be injected into the muscle. So this one takes a few more steps to put together, but um, not too difficult. Every kit again should come with um, two pre-filled vials of the medication, two MAD devices, and two syringes. So with this one. What you'll do is you'll pop off all the colored pieces. So there's a top to the two tops of the syringes and then the cap of the vial. And then you're gonna put the medication into the syringe. And, and on top, you screw on the mat device. And again, this is what allows it to be given in the nose. So with this one, you'll get one half of the syringe in one nose, one half in the other. You can estimate it doesn't have to be exactly half and half, but just putting it into both nostrils. And then again, just like the other forms, you're gonna repeat it with the other device in two to three minutes if that person is still not responsive. So I know I went through that quickly. There's videos for all of these devices online um, if you wanna see it done again or from the beginning, but overall, all three of these forms are pretty easy to administer. Again, make sure after you give the naloxone that you're saying person to help arrives. And then lastly, just wanted to um, mention a few of the resources we have for counties and organizations that are interested in starting naloxone programs. So a couple years ago, we developed um, a super comprehensive 50 page toolkit on naloxone distribution that probably includes more than you've ever wanted to know about naloxone distribution in our state from the laws to what standing orders would be required for your program um, how to implement a program and sustain it. Um, there's some templates for the standing orders. Um, so it has lots of um, resources for you. And if you click on the link there, um, or it's also available on the locksandsaves.org, you can find a PDF copy of that toolkit. Great resource, um, especially for CBOs and health departments that are interested in starting a program. And then for those of you who are not aware, we also recently launched um, at DHHS the opioid data dashboard. And um, with this dashboard, you're, you're actually able to see your county's progress on each strategy of the opioid action plan, including the locks and distribution. So um, I just picked statewide. This is a map of um, the whole state. See 44% of the state has at least some level of naloxone distribution. So you can actually sort by county there in the right um, top corner, search your county, and you can see what your access points for naloxone are, whether it's a pharmacy, an EMS agency that's giving out take-home doses, um, a treatment facility, health department, and see how you're doing compared to other counties or where your access points are. So really neat tool. Um, you're able to look at other strategies within our opioid action plan and how your county's doing. So um, things like treatment access or housing, um, everything that we have included in our action plan. So really neat tool. If you search North Carolina opioid dashboard, it should come up pretty easily. Um, you can play around with the tool. These are just some other best practices for overdose prevention that we're working um, on. It's looking increasing treatment access, encouraging providers to use the prescription drug monitoring program, 
um, medication lockdowns, lots of strategies that we're um, looking at at the state level. But I also know you all do tons of work in your communities and coalitions. So also wanted to thank you for all the work that you are doing um, at a local level. So that concludes today's training. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. Um, yes, do we have any questions? Stacy? Uh, do you do we have any questions in the Q&A? Yes, we do. Dr. Isaac, um, there are a few questions. Is naloxone safe for babies and toddlers? Yes, naloxone can, can be used at any age from an infant to elderly adult safely. Well, thank you. The next question is, what is the shelf life of naloxone? Yeah, so the shelf life um, actually differs based on the formulation of naloxone. Um, for Narcan, it's typically, it was actually just extended a few months ago to be 36 months, so three years. I think historically it was uh, 24 months or two years. So now the Narcan has a shelf life of about three years. Um, the the vials again you'll that differs based on the manufacturer. So the best thing is to check on um, on every medication that you get. It should have an expiration date. So these these are about three years expired at this point. Um, one example is that expired naloxone is going to work a lot better than no naloxone. However, um, keep an eye out on that if you think that your uh, naloxone is near to expiring, either get a refill or find another place to um, get another kit. Another question is, where can we find free Narcan if patients can't find it at the pharmacy? Yeah, so um, getting naloxone at our pharmacy is a great access tool, but for, again, for people that are uninsured or um, have a high copay, that's not the most realistic option. So. Um, if you go to naloxonesaves.org, there is a list of all the health departments in North Carolina that have indicated that they are giving out naloxone at no cost. And um, I believe it has contact information so you can um, call them and see if they have it available. Also syringe service programs, depending on um, what risk factors you have, they also give out free naloxone or can refer you to a place where you can get it. Um, if all else fails, please feel free to reach out to me and we will um, find a way to get you a kit. Okay, thank you. And we have one more question. Can naloxone be self-administered? Yeah, great question. So um, naloxone cannot, it's not typically self-administered. So that's why it's really important um, if you get a naloxone kit that you are showing all of your family members, friends, people that you are around how to use it and where you keep it, right? So it doesn't do much good if it's, um, you know, out in your bathroom cabinet and you're typically out and about. So having it with you um, is really important and telling people that you have it on your body. That way, if, if you need it, they can administer it for you. Thank you, Libby. That was the last question. Back to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Isaacs, thank you again for sharing so much wonderful information and helpful resources um, with us today. Uh, I would just like to thank you again for, for your presentation and thank you to everyone that joined us today. Our presentation. To, oh, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, Libby, I just saw one question that popped up in the Q&A about the onset of action for no um, Again, it works super quickly, so it should start working within two to five minutes after the dose. Again, if you feel like they um, are still unresponsive, go ahead and give that second dose after um, about two to three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, our presentation today covered behavioral health outcomes and opioid misuse, patient safety by addressing opioid best practices and reducing adverse drug events. Um, if we did not get to your answer today, of any questions that you might have, or if you think of something later, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, Alliant Quality is here to assist you, and we want to try to answer any questions that you might have. We hope to see you at some of our other upcoming events, and the link to register is in the chat for any other upcoming events. Um, please join us through your favorite social channel. Stay safe and have a wonderful day.